Um, well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Ido, um, Aviv, and Sarah for the invitation to talk here about some of our work. Now, um, what I want to try to do in the next 10 or 15 minutes is really to give you an overview of the kind of work that we've been doing um, and tell you both why we're excited about the Human Cell Atlas as well as why we believe that there might be some opportunities to add uh, additional information to that. So blood cell production or hematopoiesis as I illustrate here is arguably one of the best understood examples of cell differentiation that we know of in human physiology. And yet, despite our understanding of this, most of the analyses and most of our knowledge of this process really stems from bulk cell analyses done in elegant model organisms. And yet, there's an incredible amount we still have to learn. And as a pediatrician, every day I see patients where I'm limited in my ability to explain what I'm seeing and how their diseases or their variation uh, occurs. And so we've been interested in trying to use this not so much as a limitation, but actually as an opportunity to better understand what's happening in our patients and how this process might vary amongst uh, in different individuals. And so in our group, we've been interested in trying to take two <laughs> interrelated approaches to this problem. We've been interested in using population-based variation to try to understand how humans vary in blood cell production. And we've also been interested in trying to understand rare genetic blood disorders. And I want to try to go through uh, a vignette to, to describe each of these. So our, in, our initial interest in utilizing population-based studies really came from uh, our interest in trying to understand why do patients with the most common genetic blood disorders in the world, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, vary in their clinical presentations. And we knew that there was variation in the level of this fetal form of hemoglobin, gamma globin, that occurs after the period of infancy when normally it's silenced, that explains much of the variation in patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia. And yet despite our, our knowledge of this, we had a limited understanding of molecular factors that could explain this. And so using genome-wide association studies, we were able to identify a key regulator of this process, BCL11A. And this transcription factor acts as a rheostat to silence the gamma globin genes, such that when it's robustly expressed, gamma globin is largely silenced and there's predominant production of adult hemoglobin. And when BCL11A is at, expressed at lower levels or when it's suppressed, gamma globin is increased and fetal hemoglobin in turn increases. And this is just a small vignette, but in fact, this work has now led to an ongoing clinical trial using gene therapy approaches to silence BCL11A within a period of 10 years. And so you can see how fundamental insight into processes can lead to uh, clinical uh, interventions, potentially. Now, we've also been interested in rare genetic blood disorders and how we can gain further insight. And here in particular, single cell approaches have really revolutionized our understanding of this field. Work from Ito, John Dick, and others has shown us that rather than the traditional models that I showed you initially of hematopoiesis, that lineage commitment largely occurs at the early stages of stem and progenitor cells. And while we've gained important insight from single cell studies into how this process occurs, we don't yet know how this might be relevant in many human diseases. And so we've been particularly interested in this, in disorders that affect particular lineages, including diamond black fin anemia, which is a disorder where the earliest erythroid committed progenitors and precursors are absent from the marrow, and yet all other blood cell lineages are produced in a normal manner. And this disorder has been of great interest to us because we knew that the vast majority of cases of this disease, about 90%, are due to loss of function mutations in one of 24 different ribosomal protein subunits. Now, how that can result in a specific disorder in erythropoiesis has remained a major mystery. And so a few years ago, we were very interested in trying to identify additional causes of this disorder. And we identified some rare mutations that can cause the disorder in the transcription factor GATA1. But that, of course, raised the question, how exactly is it that these mutations in GATA1 could relate to the more commonly observed mutations in ribosomal proteins? And what we've been able to show is that the ribosomal protein mutations actually reduce the overall level of ribosomes. They don't change the composition, and this in turn affects the translation of GATA1 and very select other transcripts, but does not affect trans translation more generally. That in turn is able to reduce GATA1's level and result in the erythroid-specific defects that are observed. But 
The question, of course, remains, at what stage of hematopoiesis does this occur? And really building upon the work that Ito and others have done, we've been able to now show that, in fact, GATA1 expression is, in fact, impaired at the very early stages of stem and progenitor cells, at least as far as we're able to see using uh, phenotypic markers. And indeed, that, that reduction persists as the cells undergo further differentiation, but really arises at a very early stage. I think explaining a lot of um, mysteries that have been present in this field in general. Now, I've described some vignettes on how we've been able to use genetics to better understand hematopoiesis and gain further insight. And of course, we're very excited in using single cell approaches to apply this. But we've also been very interested in trying to better develop approaches to try to understand the dynamics of hematopoiesis and ways that we can do this. Now, there's been some discussion about lineage tracing approaches. And in model organisms, lineage tracing has been incredibly valuable to understand the dynamics by which different cell populations are produced in the context of different physiologic systems, including hematopoiesis. And I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time, but I'll only say that there's been a whole variety of methods that have been used. But the problem, of course, is that we're talking here today about the human cell atlas, and we can't go and barcode humans. We do occasionally in our gene therapy <laughs> trials, but we generally don't do that. And so really developing an approach to try to understand the dynamics in all these systems that, we're, that we'll be talking about in the coming days is really a critical goal. And this is a goal that we, in a really wonderful collaboration with Aviv's lab, uh, with a joint postdoc, Life Ludwig, have been trying to tackle. And what we've been exploring is the use of somatic mutations in the mitochondrial genome as a way to try to develop lineage tracing. And what we can do is we can actually take the 16 KB mitochondrial genome and examine mutations that could occur in a heteroplasmic fashion where typically there's hundreds to uh, a few thousand copies of the mitochondrial genome present and detect mutations that might be present at certain allele fractions or certain heteroplasmic fractions. And occasionally some of these mutations might go to homoplasmic uh, states where every mitochondrial genome present in that cell has such a mutation. And in fact, such approaches have been successfully implemented to perform lineage tracing, at least at low resolution, where, for example, people can look at markers such as um, cytochrome C oxidase, as shown here. And using immunist chemical staining, one can see that there are certain crypts in the intestine that stain positively, but occasionally there are negative crypts. And in fact, when people have gone back and then sequenced those CRIPS, they indeed find loss of function mutations in cytochrome C oxidase explaining that. And so the question, of course, is can we use some of the approaches that are being done in projects like the Human Cell Atlas to start to infer and get insight into this? And in fact, it turns out that many of the technologies that we're employing, including ATAC-seq, um, where in about 50% of the reads are in fact mitochondrial genomes, as well as even um, uh, approaches like SMART-C2, uh, where about 50% of the mitochondrial genome is covered, get reasonable coverage of this. And I'll give you a couple of examples where we've been able to utilize these approaches to actually start to get information about lineage mapping. Now, one, one of the proof of principles that we've been trying to do is actually to take cell lines and actually experimentally derive single cell clones from these populations, and then look over time at what's happening. And in fact, if we create an experimental tree, such as I've shown you here, using single cell cloning, then what we can do is actually subject these cells to a tax seek. And when we do this from the bulk populations that we've derived from these initial progenitors, we're able to perfectly reconstruct this map using um, somatic mutations in the mitochondrial genome with reasonable heteroplasmic frequencies greater than 1%. And so this allows us to actually reconstruct and create barcodes that occur endogenously within the cells that then allow us to reconstruct this. And in fact, we've been able to use these approaches in um, samples from primary human samples, for example, in single cell attack seek samples from different donors to, for example, as I show you here, actually be able to se separate out samples from different donors and get it at least at that resolution. And as we're doing further work on different phenotypes, we're now trying to work on getting better resolution as we um, deconstruct these samples. 
Moreover, we can also, although we have to use information at higher heteroplasmic frequencies, we can separate out different donors. Here, for example, from a data set of chronic myelogenous leukemia samples, where we're able to perfectly separate out different donors using such approaches. And moreover, within these populations, we can start to separate out temporally different samples at different time points, and moreover, separate out samples, for example, those that are positive for mutations causal of the disease from those that do not have the mutation present. And so we believe that such approaches could be beneficial to start to gain some insight from the rich data that we're gathering in projects such as this uh, to be able to gain further insight. And so with that, I just wanted to finish by acknowledging the people who've done much of the work that I've described, including Leif Ludwig, who's um, joint in uh, Aviv's lab, in my lab, who's been um, doing much of the work that I've described, as well as a number of other people, and numerous fantastic collaborators, including Aviv, who we've had a very, very close and f a fantastic collaboration with. With that, I'm happy to take any questions.